Hello, yep. Melina. Girls oh. are so <laughs> uncooperative. So, the particular veil hemming stitch that we're learning is just a simple whip stitch. However, what makes it stand out and the reason why textiles and clothing discussed it is because it was very popular, apparently, from what we've seen. And it makes a very, very nice finishing edge on fine silks, like what they made veils out of in the 14th century. And I'm wearing an example right here. If anybody has not seen it, that is the hem. Now, because it's really hard to see fine silk with white thread on a computer screen, I brought examples. This is what the stitch looks like. Basically just rolled the edge of the fabric and then whip stitched around it. And the example piece that I'm going to be sewing tonight is just like this, bright red embroidery floss on heavy white linen so you can see everything. Do we have any questions so far? Okay. Could you use a felling stitch also? Um, there are lots of things that you could use. This seems to have been the preferred method, at least in the area where people were dumping their old scraps into the Thames River. Sounds good. <laughs> we're talking about an era where what we do over here in this valley and what we have done in this valley for centuries may or may not be the same thing that they're doing two valleys over. It might even speak something that we can't understand. So Katie's coming out. Let me mute myself. Uh, sorry. No, actually I told people that this is not a class that I expect to be noisy. So if you want to leave the sound on so you can pop up with questions, that would be great. That would actually make it feel like I'm not just sitting in my house alone. Okay. So I'm going to tip this down a little bit so you can see what I'm doing better. Okay. So the process gets started by taking the edge of the fabric, which you've cut to something approximating a pleasant curve, and you roll the edge. You just get it between finger and thumb and roll it. And you could start this anywhere, but I found that it's easiest to work if I start near one edge of a straight of grain, like a selvage, and then I do the curve that's at one end of it and continue around to the other straight of grain, etc. So after I've rolled it, I'm pinching it in that hand and I take my needle and I slide it in from the direction that I intend to work at, because that just works best, I think. And I slide it in as far as it'll go And then I pull it out through the roll. So you can see that kind of right here. And then I take a stitch right there where my thread came out to lock it in place. And then I hold it and I roll just down from there till I have something nice and neat. Wrap it around my finger, because that keeps my tension the same. 
a smooth it with a fingernail. And then I take another stitch. And at least on your finished silk veils, the stitches should be about two millimeters apart. On your practice material, that could vary depending on how amenable your practice material is to getting rolled. So you just take those stitches and whip stitch is a very basic stitch. So you know the process already if you've done much hand sewing at all. Just imagine doing it on a fine silk veil. So who's sewing along? I have a bit of embroidery that I'm working on at the same time, trying to clear out some unfinished projects. You know, the world will come to an end if you finish out all the unfinished projects. <laughs> just finishing one would be good <laughs> just one so the world is in no danger of coming to an end not in the least <laughs> at least not from me good <sighs> okay if anyone is sewing along and you have any questions or something doesn't seem right speak up because I can only guess okay That's a very good question. Maybe it has ended. Now when you're holding it looped around your finger like that, are you applying much tension or is it, or when you're using the silk, does silk have much give to it when you're holding it that way or? Silk is just like any other fabric as far as that's concerned. It has virtually no give on the straight of grain, but it gives a lot on the bias. Okay. And you want to hold it tensioned just so, so that the bias doesn't stretch out any more than the straight of grain is going to. Okay. Will that cause it to be wavier or? At some point it's going to get wavy anyway, but you know, if you pull it out too much, it could get completely lettuce-setted instead of Slightly wavy. Sorry, I just got home from the store, jumped out of the shower, but you're sliding the needle up the f your finger lift to go under it and up here at the top? Um, yes, I'm sliding the needle along my finger mm -hmm. so that I don't poke my finger, which could happen if I tried doing it this way. But coming in like this, I slide it in and then I poke it up just just on my side of where the roll is. Okay. So I tuck it in as tight to where the roll is as I can manage. Thank you. 
You're welcome. Is it a slight diagonal or is it straight? There is a slight diagonal because otherwise your stitches would be in the same place. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. The places where you go through the fabric should be about two millimeters apart. If you weren't doing it on a slight diagonal, they'd be... <laughs> yeah. I've only ever used a magic hemming stitch, which ah. is different. Yeah. Yes, that is different. The reason the hem stitch is not a good idea when it comes to super fine veils is your with the hem stitch, you only want to grab two or three threads at most. And when those threads are super, super fine, there's way too big of a chance that one of them will break and your stitches will start to come out. With this, the threads actually wrap around the hemmed edge. So the chances of something coming out is minimal. So it's rolled to the right, to your right? It's rolled from the edge. Towards you. Toward the middle. Toward the okay. uh, center of the veil. Okay. So if I can't tell. Just by wetting your fingers? Yeah. I think next time I do this class, I should get a brightly colored piece of fabric instead of white. <laughs> Maybe even something with an ugly pattern, <laughs> so you can- something, <laughs> something even not blue, so it'll show up against your clothing. I don't know if I have anything not blue. You can <laughs> buy something yellow or red or something, woman. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was joking. I do actually have yellow and red. They tend to look really good with blue. <laughs> of course they do. Supporting <laughs> colors. <laughs> <laughs> I think for this class, I actually want something with a pattern so you can see where the roll covers up the pattern of the fabric. But I wasn't thinking about that. So how much do you roll it just to cover the edge? Just to cover the edge? The raw Basically, edge? Basically, yes. Basically just enough that you've covered the raw edge and it's not going to come out. The pieces of old veils that they found in the London landfills, the roll was one millimeter across. So this part of it, the roll was one millimeter across. Basically half the dimensions of this 10 ounce linen. Now, I'm going to show you how to make a knot and how to start over, because at some point you're going to have to do that. Making the knot is probably the trickier part because you don't want it to be where it shows. So basically, I unroll the roll just ahead of my latest stitch, and I stick the needle through what's left of the roll so that it catches the fabric inside. And I take a stitch and I grab some more of that fabric and just make a knot the usual way, you know, put the needle through the loop, pull the loop tight. Do that two or three times, cut the thread. So I've done that. And I neglected to grab scissors, so give me a second. Never. While she's doing that, I just wanted to pop in and say hi to everybody since it's the meeting night. Hello. Hello, Your Excellency. I'm in disguise. I cut everything off. Qua? I cut my beard off, so I'm, I'm in disguise. Aha. Uh -huh. It was time for it to go. 
It was summertime? Eh, I get a... Some people change their hair color. I break out the razor. Hello, Dame Anne. I see you. It's Theory. It's been so long. How are you doing? I don't know. They I'm doing are. pretty well. <laughs> yeah. Have you gotten any progress with the left-handed bow? Haven't had a chance to string it yet. Um, I'm hoping to get it done. I have the tests on the optic nerve uh, to do next week. So that should be okay. just loads of fun. But otherwise, I'm doing well. So Good. thank you. I'm glad yeah. you I miss shooting with you. Oh, I do too. Uh, I really enjoy archery, but I do have the new left-handed bow and I'm going to practice exercising the alternate arm and hopefully it'll get done. But back to the class. <laughs> okay, yes, we're ready. So after you've got your new length of thread and you put a knot in it, you're going to go up through the middle of that rolled edge. And I like to go far enough up that I'm going to be stitching over at least three stitches. So these three stitches right here, the last ones that I took, I'm going to be going over them again and just making sure that if they come out, it doesn't matter. Not like my knots come out, but whatever. And then I roll the roll tight again and wrap it around my finger again and I keep going. I don't know if anyone here has ever noticed, but I have done this stitch while walking around an event, just with the veil tucked under my arm. <laughs> I suspect it looks very artistic. I suspect that licking my finger part of it will not be happening in the near future at events. <laughs> Pure veil. Yes, however... Um, well, on hot days, you can just dab some, you know... Sweat? I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, That's right. Ladies don't sweat, we glow. Yes. That's right. Dab it in your goblet of water. Yes. That's right. Yeah. This seems to be totally um, counter to any comfortable. I feel like I'm doing it backwards. Are you left handed? No, I am right handed. Okay. So. Um, because I know that I've had a student in the past who was left-handed. And for her, it came out looking like a mirror image of what we were doing. Mm. So. My stitches slant. Um. Like a slash. Her stitches slanted like a backslash. Well, I've been doing... Let me see if I can see. Like this. Mm -hmm. Like what it looks like you're That's doing. Right. Like, Yeah, mine are a backslash. Hers are the slash. From the back. It just feels like it should be going the other way. Like... I don't know. I feel like I'm doing it backwards. Um, could you hold it up so I can see it, maybe? Uh, change who's the big screen? One second. Okay. 
Let me mute a second. To check what they're barking at. Sorry, we have these these dogs with huge ears for for warning system here here in the sticks. Okay, so I have it rolled like this. Hold it up vertically. Okay, I have it rolled like this. Yes. So it's rolled towards the middle. And then I'm, I'm sewing like this, but it feels like I'm just kind of reaching in the most awkward way possible around the back of it. And that can't be how they did this hour after hour after hour to produce these things. Mm -hmm. I, f I feel like it should be yeah, laid over my me. finger. Can you put your hands up and show me how you're holding it? I was holding it with the roll going down my going down my finger and then sewing like this. Um I can't see anything. Yeah. Um hold it up in front of your face. <laughs> okay, so this? Yeah. Okay. Hang on. Let me see if I can uh, make Okay, so I have it holded, the holded. <laughs> I'm holding it like this over, okay. trying to get it in the in the picture. So older over my finger like this. Right. And I'm reaching around. Okay, you're making like I'm a left-handed person trying to write. Okay. You know, across. You know, except it's opposite. And it's just, it's not an ergonomic or comfortable way to do it. So I'm wondering if I'm holding it backwards. Should I, I be holding it like this? I think you just have your hands twisted around too much. But if we can put I it back to where think I, I'm do I think if I do it this way, it's just that this way I can't really hold it around my finger easily because because then most of the fabric is in the way. Can you flip right. it around so the yeah. fabric is draped over your fingertips and the hand yeah. is towards your knuckles? That's well, that's what I'm doing, but it makes it backwards. Oh, okay, I see, okay. I see. Flip it back so that I'm the one on sh the big screen. Okay, you spotlighted me, so, okay. Okay, now you see how I'm holding it? Okay, so it's falling off of your, yeah. It's wrapped around my left index finger. Right. My tall finger and my thumb are holding it in position. Right. And my right hand is just sliding it in and going to the next one. And it's- But it's still, it's still, I don't think I need a scrunchie on my hand. It's still. Oh, I maybe I'm no. I guess I'm just exaggerating the motion too much. I think so, but do you do much hand sewing at all? Yes. Okay. I actually prefer hand sewing because I think that um, the sewing machines are. Uh, more of a pain in the butt than they really need to be. Yeah, my first experience with the sewing machine, I ran out of the room because it was so noisy and scary. <laughs> I refer to the sewing machine as my husband's sewing machine because, you know, he bought it so that he could make the the Mongolian gear for us, and I haven't used it since. He's our sewer. I'm the embroiderer. I hand embroider. You don't hold yeah. embroidery like this. <laughs> okay. Unless you're embroidering without a hoop. 
Well, this is the same position that I hold fabric in when I'm doing hand sewing of a hem. So like, how's right? this? Yeah. I think I'm doing better. Okay, does it feel more natural? A little bit, yeah. Okay. This is a piece of sheet that I'm making into a handkerchief. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> this stitch right here is a basic hem stitch, you know, that just catches a few threads. And it's the same way that I hold it for anything else. Okay. If you're doing I'm it- I'm gonna mute myself so you guys don't have to hear the vicious dogs. And yeah, they're scary. It's our girl telling our boy where he can stick it. <laughs> Apparently nowhere. Yeah, well, he's just, he's just, you know, they're just wrestling. Uh-huh. And she's just asserting her authority. Apparently she's the dominant. Yes. So, I also brought some fabric to show you how to cut a rounded curve for your veils. Are we ready to move on to that? Okay. So that's at least one yes. Do we have any other references one way or the other? It's good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I use the pulled thread method to get a straight line for cutting my veils. Basically, I cut a rectangle that's the length that I want it to be. And then if I want a round or an oval veil, I give it some rounded corners. So this one right here is a yard and a half long. It is a real veil, not 10 ounces of linen. And I'm currently pinning it so that all four layers are going to be treated together. Unfortunately, habitoy is very slippery. This is five ounce habitoy. You can, well, I'm going to be making some winter veils that are 12 ounce uh, silk twill. But for normal use, you can use a lightweight habitoy or a lightweight silk gauze. The three ounce, or three mom, I should say, the three mom silk gauze is what I tend to use for my veils. Where do you get your silk? That is dharmatrading.com. Same place people get silk um, uh, silk banner supplies. Yes. Silk painting. Yes, they do a lot of dyes and painting supplies. Okay. So I don't know how visible the pins are but I have pinned all four layers of fabric together at the corners. This is where all four corners are. And now I'm laying it out on my handy cardboard cutting mat with the one inch markings. And I have found that for my head size and veil size, the best method for making the curve is to go in and up three one inch squares right at the corner. I don't know if you can see that. And then from that first mark, I go down one 
and closer to the edge one, right there. And then I go over two and down one. And then down three to the edge, sometimes a little bit more right there, so three and a half. Then I do the other side of the curve right here. So one and one, one and two, and then one and three and a half. And I hope you can see at least some of those blue dots. Then I use my fabric marker to connect those blue dots in a nice curve. Had to move that pin because it was right where I needed to mark. There. <laughs> They're protecting you. Sorry. That's okay. So I'm going to tip the camera just a bit in hopes that you can see this a little bit better. Do you see the dots and the line? You can definitely see the dots. Kind of make out the line, but we can see it there. Okay, good. So that's the general idea. And that approximate curve is probably going to work for you. If not, tweak it a little bit and get one that does. And you do this in all four corners? No, I've... I've piled it up so that all four corners are right here. Okay. Thank that you. way, yes, it's much, much easier to make them identical, which is what you want, right? And then I pin through all four layers of fabric on either side of that curved line that I just drew. I don't want anything shifting while I'm cutting. And silk is slippery, so I'm putting these pins a little closer together than I normally would. Bucky, what are you growling at, a squirrel? I think he wants a T-R-E-A-T, -E and he's trying to convince me that he's protecting me from something. Can you see the pins? Okay. So now that I have it marked and very thoroughly pinned, I just come along here and cut.
Now, I have one veil that just needs to have all these pins removed and needs to be hemmed. And I have four more of the sample pieces that people use in my class for learning this stitch. How much um, fray do you have with those pieces that you're going to store for your classes? Do you need to treat any of those edges while storing or do, do they stay together fairly well? Well, at first I would use hairspray on the edge to make sure that nothing came undone. And then I realized that it's going in a Ziploc baggie. And it doesn't, need to have hairspray on it for the edge to stay good. I have some that I've had for a while and they still look like this basically. For your, for your veil that you'll be working on with it being a longer term project, just the hairspray then? I could hairspray it. I usually just stick it in a baggie. It doesn't come out of the Ziploc baggie unless I'm working on it. Mm -hmm. And if you think you might mess it up, I recommend hairspray. Okay. But for the I, most part, you're not experiencing that problem? Correct. Okay, cool. I thought I would show you one that I'm working on right now. Here it is in its baggie. The needle that I'm using is stuck through a different piece of fabric so that it's easier to control. And I usually have a pair of nips in there and some extra silk in case I wander away from my spool. I got this, I think this was Thai silks. It might have been Dharma trading. But you can also get silk thread at Johann's or wherever. When I'm working with this one, I pull it out. Sometimes it's neatly folded and sometimes it's just kind of balled up in there, but it works. Contrasting fabric makes it easy to tell where I was working. needle off of it and it's the same process I like to use a fingernail to neaten up my roll and I just slide the needle under there Is there a specific size needle that we should be looking for or thread? Mm -hmm. As far as the thread goes, from what I've experienced, any kind of silk thread will work as long as it's not outrageously different from sewing thread sizes. Okay. I do prefer using 
the type of beading needle that's shaped like a regular needle just has a longer skinnier body oh okay beading needle it's just not going to move the threads aside nearly as much as a thicker needle will and you know the less the threads move aside the less i have to hope they come back That's very important with the gauze because, you know, gauze is so delicate there. This is a great project for sitting in court because it fits in your basket very nicely. And it doesn't take up your whole lap. So after you've accomplished sewing these gorgeous long huge veils or small veils, how do you store them so that you don't have to be constantly ironing them because ironing is the bane of my existence and I avoid it at all costs? <laughs> um, I hang them up to dry and silk is kind of crisp anyway so if I flick it till it's almost dry then hang it up to dry it basically takes on the shape that I want it to have which is mostly flat and then I put each one in a separate little baggie with its approximate size on it so I can go oh I want a shoulder length veil today or oh I want one that comes down to my knees today but you don't like roll it in a tube around a tube or anything fancy, you just fold it up. Is it better yes. to roll it than to fold? Okay. Is it what? Better to roll it up than to fold it. Um you take out this one here. This is a floor length oval. Notice it was in its own little ziploc. And it's just been gently folded. And there are some crease marks where it's been folded, but those disappear when I wear them. So generally the weight of the veil itself while it's being worn is going to pull those creases out? Yes, and they're not extreme anyway, but between the very light weight of the veil and our very high humidity, they go away. And besides, having creases in your veil or in your clothing in general was not exactly <laughs> Something that wasn't seen. That's how I justify having wrinkly linen garb. It's medieval! There's a difference between wrinkly wrinkly and folded wrinkly. For a lot of our time period, if you weren't wearing your clothes or airing them out, they were folded up in a chest with some lavender or something. And so they would get folded up in the chest wrinkles. Thank you. You're welcome. So there's a really cool um, image. I don't remember if it's from a painting or from like a manuscript page, but it shows a woman wearing an apron that is very clearly creased. Like it has been folded into a little square and it is creased. And it was actually a sign that she was well to do and didn't have to wear her apron to work in. It was a pretty show, look at me, I'm fancy kind of yes. thing. 
So sometimes creases and things like that are actually sort of a status. Right. And the reasoning behind that is if I'm wearing the same apron every single day, it's never going to get those creases. If I just took that apron out of the chest this morning, it's going to have those creases. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be my justification from now on. <laughs> you can even iron those creases in place. You know, and sew it, those suckers in. Stack <laughs> it up and iron it so that it's very clearly been in the chest for weeks. <laughs> you know those faux creases on pants and stuff where they run a line of stitching to make it look yeah. like it's a permanent crease? That's what we're uh, gonna do. That's right. That works. Raise your social standing right there. Excellent. Yes, Robert. Florida humidity acts as a steamer. <laughs> And I kind of got into the veil lengths, but haven't actually. Um, we don't know which time periods this particular stitch was in use, other than that it was very popular in the 14th century when they had the super fine silk veils. But I have done this stitch with a Roman veil that is long enough I didn't bother measuring it. I just draped it. I have done it with an oval one that's basically just barely big enough to go down to my shoulders. And I've done it with everything in between. If you're doing this on a rectangular veil, which a lot of the earlier ones are, you're not going to cut off the corner the way I just showed you to. You're going to, let's see. This is a rectangular one that I have that I made a few years ago. And I don't know if you can tell, but I basically just rolled the corner enough to get started. And I rolled straight across to the other corner. And I did not do the salvages because that was unnecessary and they wouldn't have. And then I came down here to the other end. And I rolled the corner just enough to get started. Went straight across and rolled it at the other end, just enough to get it finished neatly. So you can do just about any size or shape of veil. I might not use this for the highly structured 15th century ones that looked like they had 10 layers of linen on their heads, but there are other hem treatments that are better for that kind of veil anyway. Does anyone have a question? Not that I can think of. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm just going to keep practicing on cloth before I start on the silk. <laughs> Thank you so much for teaching. You're welcome. And when you're ready to work on silk, I've told you where I get mine. Yep. If you don't want to go that step, 
I generally have some silk on hand that I'll sell for whatever I bought it for. And you said that you get the habitai or the silk gauze? Either of those. Most of my veils are silk gauze, but the shinier ones, like the one in my hand, um, those are habitoi. So and they have three millimeter and four and a half millimeter silk gauze. The double M stands for mom, which is a unit of mass, M-O-M-M-E. -M -E. And the three mom gauze is this super light stuff like what I usually wear. Five mom is the lightest weight of habitoy that I usually can find, which is not nearly as transparent. And I recently bought, so recently that it hasn't arrived yet, some 12 mom twill silk that among other uses will be winter veils, including maybe something for face. <laughs> if we're still doing that when we actually get to play again. Oh, and this veil that I'm wearing right now is a long oval that I folded in half to make a D shape. Looks like it comes in a bunch of different widths. Yes. Um, for most fails, the 35 inch width is going to be sufficient. That'll make a round fail that's one yard across. If you want to make a lot of oval veils, I might suggest the 45 inch, which gives you a short oval at one yard across. Or you can turn it the other way and have a larger, longer oval, however big you want it to be. Um, a few years ago, I made one of these for a friend and hers was an oval that was nine yards long. Hmm. <laughs> That's a wedding veil. Yes, that's a wedding veil, or a queen's coronation veil, or something like that. I have a question. Yeah. I'm, I'm seeing, I'm looking at the, the silk gauze right now, and I'm right. seeing on it, it says, use fire retardant on lightweight fabrics such as this when using for drapery, public installations, any kind of decoration, not recommended for wearables except as linings or when felted. Uh, you know, that's the kind of warning that they have to give now because everything's stupid. But that is the type of silk that is intended for veils and things of that nature. Okay, so just don't worry about it. It's just a don't be stupid warning. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, basically, don't, don't think you're going to make a veil with it. <laughs> basically, if I'm holding a candle like this, I might be being stupid. If I'm letting that happen, I might be really stupid. <laughs> but for normal use, it's perfectly fine. Okay. If the candle is out here, it's perfectly safe. If I've got the candle here, I've probably got other problems. <laughs> and the oh. 3 mm is what you want in the gauze, correct? That's my preferred weight for it, yes. Because if I'm going with a silk veil, it might as well be as super fine as I can get. Because, you know, the finer it is, the wealthier I clearly am. Okay. We're going to do that. Yeah. Good. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for joining the class. You're welcome. It was wonderful to have all of you.
think it just turns to social time. Is it social time? I mean, I don't know. I think it is. I think I'm going to continue sewing on my veil during our social time, but just chat away. And I think we can probably turn off the recording now that we're socializing. <laughs>